welcome to another edition of Resistance TV. Tonight we're discussing the devastating earthquake that recently struck Turkey and Syria. The response from the West was very different when it came to the two countries though. Whilst aid poured into Turkey, Syria was disregarded and the West sanctions against Syria remained in place. So joining me to discuss the situation in Syria tonight is the fearless investigative journalist, Vanessa Beely. Her work is highly regarded by people like the legendary John Pilger, and she was a finalist for the prestigious Martha Gellhorn Prize for Journalism. She's been on the ground in Syria, in Aleppo, and she joins us from Syria tonight. Hi, Vanessa. Vanessa, how are you? Hi, Chris. Thank you so much for inviting me on. Well, it's a great privilege to, to have you on, and somebody of your standing and, and acumen and your detailed knowledge of the situation on the ground in Syria, I think, will be invaluable. I wonder if you could maybe just start by just setting the scene for us in terms of, you know, the level of devastation that uh, that you've actually witnessed, uh, particularly places like, you know, Aleppo, where, where you've just uh, returned from. Well, yeah, I mean, in Aleppo, it's pretty horrific. Basically, the, all of northern Syria, which includes, of course, the northwestern uh, pocket, which is dominated and controlled by Al-Qaeda, uh, funded by the West and their allies. But uh, even apart from that very small uh, area of territory, northwestern Syrian territory, pretty much all of Syria felt at least the first two earthquakes. The first, of course, was, I think, around 7.8. Some people said uh, even as high as 8.1. Uh, but it was a substantive uh, earthquake, which was felt even in Jordan, uh, Lebanon, here in Damascus. Uh, people felt it, the buildings were shaking. But the worst areas um, were the north of Syria, Turkey also, of course. Um, yes. But the northern uh, region of Syria, which included the coastal areas, so Latakia, Tartus, Jable, uh, Aleppo, Hama, uh, Homs, uh, and then the northern countryside, as I described. Yeah. I just came back from three days in Aleppo, and I have to say it was it was really heartbreaking. I mean, you know, I've been in Syria since 2016. Um, I was in Aleppo, eastern Aleppo, when it was liberated in December 2016 from the terrorist occupation. And then there was extensive damage, uh, war damage, of course, both from the terrorists and from the liberation campaign itself. But in all honesty, uh, in the years uh, following that, the, the, the Syrian authorities had cleaned all the streets, everything was being rebuilt, including the old souk and many of the kind of uh, heritage sites in Aleppo that had been damaged much of it had been rebuilt and restored and was well on the way to to being fully restored to go back now and see the same streets littered again uh with rubble and and i think the most frightening thing for me was to hear from people that were there at the time when it happened and of course we have no electricity in syria because of sanctions and also because of the US occupation of Syrian resources in the Northeast, we'll come on to that later. Um, it was pitch black. So when the first earthquake hit in some areas, people fled their homes and yeah. were running in pitch darkness through very narrow streets. Uh, and around them, the buildings were falling and killing them as they were running. Yeah. Um, so, you know, entire families were wiped out in, in literally two minutes of an earthquake. So 11 years of war, uh, and everyone sort of said to me, you know, in the war, if a shell fell, it shell in, in one localized area. And yes, there was terror and trauma in this localized area. But with this earthquake, it's literally affected every single part of the city in, in one atom. Um, and the fear that continues, I mean, while I was there, there was, a, I, I think, around a five earthquake in southern Turkey, which again shook the building that I was in. And now the, the terror and trauma that people are experiencing, having already sort of gone through the first two major earthquakes, um, is, is absolutely devastating. It's devastating yeah, to see it. Um, and it's devastating for the people to deal with it. Of course. I mean, how, how are people coping, uh, Vanessa? Yeah. 
given the terribly traumatic well event. i mean you know they're syrian and yeah. one thing i learned about syrians during my time here during the war uh, living through sanctions done through the post war although the war isn't entirely finished but the major part of the military campaign is finished there yeah. is a relative stagnation of the military combat right now um, but the, you know the the free fall of the economy, the, the the tightening of sanctions, the Caesar Act being brought in, which effectively blockades and besieges uh, Syria and punishes any other country for coming to the aid of Syria. Of course, you yeah. know the Caesar law is unprecedented sanctions, unilateral sanctions, unilateral coercive measures that do not have UN mandate, so they are arbitrary. They were brought in by the US, UK, EU, Turkey and Arab League to effectively collectively punish the Syrian people who didn't want regime change. That's that's the yeah. bottom line. Yeah. Um, so, you know, the people here had gone through 11 years of war, then the crippling economic measures uh, weaponized against them, the occupation by the United States and the UK of the Northeast. Uh, yes. via their Kurdish separatist uh, proxies. Um, the theft of Syrian oil and resources, which include wheat and barley, under the Trump yeah, administration, yeah. they were burned. Yes. Um, vast areas of forestry and uh, arable land was destroyed and burned. Even yes. under the Biden administration, Samantha Power, who now heads up USAID, tried to import genetically modified seed, which would have destroyed yeah. The agricultural territory for 10 years to come. So, you know, the hybrid war against Syria has been probably one of the most savage, vindictive and barbaric in history. And, and yet and yet it's being perpetrated by the so-called <laughs> West who who portray themselves as kind of, uh, you know, the civilised part of the world, don't they? I mean, how, how do people view the West, uh, yeah. the United States, Britain, the European Union? I mean, are people... I mean, obviously, they know they've, they're suffering the consequences of it. I mean, but, but how do people view? I mean, it's, it's kind of, you know, I can't get my head around how these individuals in the political class can be so ruthless and cruel mm. and, and visit such deprivation and hardship on, on so it's many people. It's incredible. I mean, it, it is literally a genocide of the Syrian people that are the wrong Syrian people, because, of course, the aid right now, um, both funding and aid from the UK, the US and the EU is flooding into the Northwest pocket, which is totally, as I said, under the control of Al Qaeda or under its branding, Hayat Sir Tariq al Sham, previously Nusra Front, under the command of Abu Mohammed Jolani, one of the most, uh, you know, uh, vicious terrorists that was operating inside Syria during the 11 years. Um, the only humanitarian crossing into that area is Bab al Hawa, uh, which receives humanitarian aid, but that humanitarian aid comes under the control of Al Qaeda and it is basically sold, it's traded to the Syrian people at extortionate prices, or it's traded outside of, of Syria. So it's basically a revenue yes. um, income for Al-Qaeda, as is the oil, of course, in the Northeast. Previously, before yeah, the Kurds, it was uh, revenue for ISIS. And Al-Qaeda also benefit um, from the oil theft because they have a monopoly on the processing of the oil in the Northwest. So the, the oil is stolen from the Northeast, it's transported to the Northwest, and Al-Qaeda has a monopoly on the processing of that with their um, organization called Watad. And then, of course, they sell it back into Turkey and then to Israel. Um, and, and this, so, and this, I mean, and presumably the Western powers are, you know, tacitly allowing this to. Yeah, to, absolutely. To, to, of mean, course they are. I mean, they're perfectly aware of who controls. I mean, look, yeah. Ambassador Jeffries, who uh, was basically Pompeo's, Mike Pompeo's point man on Syria, admitted that Al Qaeda was an asset for the US. Brett yeah. McGurk has made a statement saying that the, the Northwest. Idlib uh, is the biggest Al Qaeda haven since 9/11. Jake Sullivan, in an email to Hillary Clinton in 2012, also said that well, Al Qaeda is working for us uh, inside Syria. So this is, you know, this is documented. This isn't some yeah. conspiracy theorism. This is a well-known, no. documented fact that the West mm -hmm. is uh, again 
deploying Al Qaeda, as of course they did in Afghanistan, as they have done um, in Iraq, in Libya, and Yemen, um, to effectively destabilize the country and and to topple the regime that they deem not to yeah. be compliant with U.S. and U.K. foreign policy. What, what do you make, uh, Vanessa, then, of, of the? Um... I refer to them as NATO stenographers. Actually, uh, I mean <laughs> your co- your, co- your colleagues. Actually, you might say fellow <laughs> fellow fellow journalists in the corporate media. I I saw uh, 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 an item uh, the other day. I was you know, I, I don't tend to watch the corporate media that much, if I'm <laughs> honest with you. But I was in the I was in Derby Station waiting my train, and they they got the <laughs> TV on, and, and uh, they were talking about the, the situation in uh, Turkey and Syria, and they were talking about. You know how Syria actually was not getting uh, aid through, but they gave the impression that this was all Assad's fault. That you know it was his, you know, he was the one that was kind of you know, as it were, you know, preventing this from 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 happening, as it were. That that was a kind of impression that they gave. I mean, you know, you're a journalist. I mean, you're a proper journalist. But how do you account for these characters? I mean, you know, it was. Well, I mean- you know, the, I, I've had a long-term run-in, particularly with the BBC and The Guardian, <clears throat> as you yourself have, and The Times. Yeah. And I guess my opinion now is that the media, the corporate media or the colonial media, is now nothing more than an extension of the security agencies of the governments they work for. Right. Yeah. So I consider BBC to be nothing more than an extension of MI6, and they, you know, we know from the leaked UK Foreign Office uh, documents that revealed the extent to which the media, of course, led by the BBC, basically supported and provided PR uh, and whitewashing uh, for the armed terrorist groups inside Syria, um, all of whom pretty much in most of the areas where they operated come under the control of Al-Qaeda. I mean, Nusra Front were the, were the dominant uh, faction inside Syria. And so, to, to, to be honest, I tend to see the media as just as criminally responsible for the suffering yes. of the Syrian people that they have effectively disappeared for 11 years. I mean, as you yes. said, they, they blame Assad for the aid not getting to Syria. Now, note the, fa- the term they use, Syria. But in fact, Syria for them is this northwest pocket, which is controlled by Al Qaeda. The rest of Syria yes. doesn't exist for them. Doesn't exist the for rest them, of no. Syria that is being serviced by their own emergency relief uh, organizations, like the real Syria Civil Defense and, and the Syrian Fire Brigades, that have been crippled and decimated by sanctions and by war for 11 years, and they don't receive funding. Let me give you an indication. The White Helmets, which is effectively a CIA MI6 construct, yeah. established which, which, which is heralded as this, as this great yeah. sort of, uh, civil aid organization yeah. in this country. But again, they're only operating in the Northwest under the control yeah. and, and alongside Al-Qaeda, and that has been the, their case throughout their history. Since 2013, um, they've received uh, millions in funding. But let me give you an idea. Their annual budget is 35 million minimum, 35 million for 3,000 volunteers. Volunteers, they are given a salary. In the bulk of Syria, so where 80% of the population are under the protection of the Syrian government and the Syrian army, there is a real Syria civil defense and there is a real Syria fire brigade. Their annual bu- budget for 10,000 volunteers is $50,000. So let's compare the two, 35 million coming into an Al-Qaeda auxiliary and 50,000 funding the emergency relief services that have been rescuing the majority of the victims of the earthquake. And when they say that Assad is responsible, let me again give you an example. Who has actually been preventing? Damascus has been trying since the earthquake happened to send aid through southern Idlib, which is under the Syrian army control. So through Sarakeb, through the Syrian Arab Red Crescent. And they have been negotiating with the armed groups in the northwest to allow humanitarian aid convoys into the northwest to the Syrian people that are under the occupation of Al-Qaeda backed by the West. Who has refused that aid? Abu Mohammed Jolani, the leader of HTS. 
Yes. How can Assad be responsible um, for the incoming aid from outside Syria through the northern borders? Because the northern border is under the control of Turkey, Al Qaeda, yeah. the US, <laughs> and yes. the Kurdish proxies. Assad doesn't have control of the northern border. No, of course not. No, no, indeed. Well, I mean, as we know, that you know, they never let the truth get in the way of a good smear. No, I mean, exactly. I was, I was a victim. <laughs> A victim of of that uh, philosophy uh, uh, myself, actually. Yeah. Uh, but I mean, you know, just talking about these journalists, um, Julian Assange, who, as we know, is languishing disgracefully in Belmarsh yeah. prison, awaiting uh, extradition, actually accused journalists of the of the type of journalists that we're talking about of actually basically, you know, party to war crime, I and mean, they're war criminals themselves. Because yeah. um, the point he makes, you know, all wars are started by uh, uh, by lies, and uh, you know the, these characters are complicit. I mean, they are the ones that sort of, you know, as it were, disseminate these these lies. Mm. Which I mean, and we're seeing this right now. Well, we're seeing it in, obviously, and I know it's well, but there is, a, you know, I suppose a military operation still going on in, in 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 Syria, but you know, maybe not to the extent they were. But we're certainly seeing this kind of misinformation, misreporting, as we've just touched upon, in relation yeah. to the uh, uh, the earthquake and the response to it. But we're certainly seeing it in terms of what's happening in uh, the uh, in Ukraine at, at the moment. But just in terms of uh, you know the impact, though, uh, Vanessa, in relation to uh, the people in Syria who've been a, a victim of this terrible earthquake. I mean, how do we know what the sort of numbers of casualties we're talking about that have been affected? I mean, it's, you know, it's in the thousands. And the thing is that they haven't recovered many of the bodies because... Um, no. And again, what about the injured? I mean, obviously, the uh, it's a tragedy. Uh, clearly, you know, people are killed, but, you know, survivors, people are injured. I mean, how are they being treated? I mean, given the restrictions that are being imposed upon uh, yeah, well, uh, I mean, Syria, again, together you know, with the yeah, um, the you know the health service has been under such enormous pressure for eleven years anyway, both from the war and the terrorist occupation of hospitals, of course, and using them as military centers, ammunition centers, um, prisons, detention centers, etc. So you know they requisition the hospitals as um, combat zones, basically. Uh, and destroyed them in the process. And then, of course, the sanctions have, which, which, you know, the West always claims that all humanitarian sectors are excluded yeah. from the sanctions. And this is an absolute abject lie um, from the UK and the US. You know, And uh, you've seen, I mean, that's not just, I mean, I say things like this, Vanessa, but you're saying it as somebody yeah. who's on the ground has seen yeah. it, witnessed it. You've seen yeah. it. Well, so I mean, to give you an idea. People listening to this need to understand that Vanessa's there on the ground. She's yeah. telling you facts on the ground. It's, it's not, uh, you know, yeah. people like and me you know, sitting the, in my comfort. Oh, sorry. Western, yeah. Western governments are lying to you. You know, you know, you have to assume yeah. they're lying to you. I mean, for example, the US, after a lot of pressure, because a number of countries did come to the aid of uh, central Syria, I'll call it now, um, like Armenia, Iran, uh, Russia, Algeria, uh, China. China just sent a 15 strong. No, I, was just about to ask, uh, actually, I was just about to ask you. I was just about to ask you that, uh, uh, mm. Vanessa. In terms of, um, we know the West is not providing uh, support, although it's that little uh, area that you that you yeah. touched upon. But I was going to ask, you know, where is a, a, a aid? You know, it's interesting. I think you just mentioned. Iran, which is also a country which has been sanctioned to yeah. death and is completely misreported, left, right, and centre. And, exactly. and I, my 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 um, social media um, output now on Twitter has been labelled Iran State Affiliated <laughs> Media because I present a program about Palestine <laughs> on the press TV platform. Well, that's it. Um, you know, that's my. Um, I have no connection to to Iran at all. I mean, you know, and Iran. The you know the, the press TV is 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 is, a, is an Iranian uh, TV uh, company. I mean, it's a bit like the BBC, you know. Um, and of course, I get pilloried, you know, for, for doing that. And uh, you know, it's, it's, yeah. the whole things the whole things are nonsense. I mean, why isn't the BBC? Why aren't the ITV? Why aren't these mainstream channels telling the truth about uh, what's happening in, in Palestine? But well, just in actually, terms of that, I mean, oh God, sorry, yes. No, no. I mean, I'd like to make that point that I haven't seen a single mainstream journalist in main Syria, in central Syria, no, no, in Aleppo, no. in Hama, in Ladakh, no, in uh, Jablai, yeah. where the majority of the victims are. I'm not saying that Idlib hasn't been hard hit. It has. 
But yeah. the Syrian people there are also suffering because they are under the control of these armed groups who are not helping yes. them. They're yeah, not so. giving them the humanitarian aid. I mean, we know that, that basically what they're doing, they're stealing it, keeping it, then another group stealing it and taking it, you know, because they know they can make money from it, basically. But what is also extraordinary is that the US made this sort of hollow gesture of apparently lifting the sanctions for six months to allow aid to come into uh, Syria. But at the same time, they introduced the caveat that they won't deal with the Syrian government. Now, the Syrian government is recognized by UN agencies. Yeah. We have OCHA, we have UNDP, we have a number of UN agencies, Syrian Arab Red Crescent, all working on the ground with Damascus. And yet the US makes this grand gesture through the treasury of lifting the sanctions that are unlawful anyway, because they don't have any mandate to to bring in and unilateral sanctions, as you know, are illegal. Um, they do impact the the humanitarian sector, and yet we still can't get we can't wire funds from outside Syria into Syria. No. The Americans have or the U.S. have more than two thousand troops inside Syria with helicopters, with surveillance equipment, with heat seeking equipment. Yeah. Why can't they send that? Exactly. Earthquake stricken areas to actually help the Syrian people. No, instead, what they're doing is releasing ISIS to further attack the Syrian people. We've had two attacks east of Homs since the earthquake, more than yeah. 100 civilians massacred, civilians, not, not military, by ISIS that are under control of the US and the UK here in, in Syria. We've had an escape of ISIS from prisons in the north that we know now are being ferried to Ukraine to fight with the Nazis in Ukraine. So yeah. rather than actually helping the Syrian people that, are, that have been again decimated by the earthquake, by, by this tragedy, in reality, they're using it, they're exploiting it to resurrect their uh, assets inside Syria, to restart a military campaign, to re-release ISIS to carry out attacks against civilians and to retake territory that they had lost after Russia intervened in 2015. So why you mentioned that the military war is, is somehow um, taking a back seat, in reality, no, it isn't. The, the big threat now is that the West, as I said, instead of coming to the aid of people that are suffering here and have been suffering for 11 years at their hands, are now increasing the military pressure on top of yeah. the economic pressure, on top of the, the, the you know, the human tragedy uh, pressure that is now on the Syrian people and the Syrian authorities to try and deal with it. Because yes, there is some help coming in from outside, but it's not enough. I mean, for, no. for example, for the first three days, they were literally digging bodies out with bare hands. They didn't have heavy uh, equipment. The heavy machinery came in from Iraq initially. So right. uh, Iraq and Russia brought in. So, 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 so you're getting support from places like Iraq, from, from Iran, from, from Russia. I mean, yeah. all, all the all the sort of uh, you know the bad guys in, in inverted commas from from the West's perspective, yeah. and uh, you know, again, yes. you, you don't you don't you, we don't hear that. I mean, if journalists were doing their job, I mean, they would be saying that that uh, that when, they, when they say would journalists be on to, the ground, Chris. Well, they, well, they would, they, they Look, would, but, yeah. but but if they're not on the ground, at least they should, at least they should be reporting the fact that yeah you know, that, that Syria's being starved and that and it's places like Iran and. And, and Russia, etc. But Russia, of course, is persona non grata. You can't say anything positive about Russia at the moment because they're, they're being totally demonised. A real Russophobia uh, go, going on in this country now. But um, I just wondered as well, uh, Vanessa, I mean, again, as I say, you're on the ground and we, you, you started to touch on mm. it in your earlier part of the interview this evening about the uh, fact that the US uh, you know, is occupying a large part of uh, Syria still. I mean, they, they're, the part they're occupying is, there's the, as I understand it, the breadbasket, you know, the most fertile agricultural part, and the uh, and the oil fields and stealing yeah. the oil. Am I, am I right on that? I mean, say a bit more. Yeah, about absolutely. That. I mean, the the thing is that you have now what you have is a situation where Syria itself is a centralized sort of state, rather like Palestine in the very early days, actually, where where territory has been annexed um, by hostile states, literally on three corners. So in the south by Israel, the southeast and northeast by the states, 
the north by Turkey and then in the northwest by Al Qaeda, which is a, a proxy of, of the West alliance that has been trying to topple the Assad government since 2011. And in reality, yes, the US, first of all, through ISIS, and then secondly, through the Kurdish uh, separatists, it has occupied and directly the, because there are American bases um, in the Northeast, there are also UK operatives <laughs> and EU operatives in the Northeast running the ISIS holding camps. I don't call them prisons, they're holding yeah. camps because what they basically do is to ferry them by helicopter from those holding camps into uh, Iraq or then into Ukraine. As we now know, there are ISIS fighters uh, in Ukraine or into whatever arena um, that, that they are fighting indirectly by proxy. Um, and that area, um, the US or its proxies is stealing 80% of Syrian oil. Um, so there is a tiny amount of Syrian resources that are trickling through. Yeah. Here, I mean, in Damascus, most areas have probably maximum three hours of electricity per day. And that's not three hours in a block. That's sort of yeah. five hours, six yeah. hours, then one hour, then half an hour. Yeah. And, and that's all people have. And we've had freezing temperatures the last two weeks. Yeah. And nobody has heating. And that's another impact on the earthquake victims. Of There's course. no electricity. There's no fuel for generators. There's no fuel for heating. There's no fuel for ambulances, for fire engines, mm. right? So, so this is having actually, when, when we talk about sanctions and we talk about aid, you know, Syria is somehow, Syrian culture is sort of aid resistant. It doesn't actually yeah. want aid. What it wants no. is for America and its allies yeah, to, to get out of Syria play off. Absolutely, and release yeah. their resources. Because sure. in the Northwest, you have some of the, the richest, most abundant agricultural land. Yeah. So that's under yeah. control of Al Qaeda. And in the Northeast, you have the oil, the wheat, the barley. And yes, as you rightly said, some of the wealthiest agricultural land in Syria. And that is occupied and everything is being sold outside Syria. And so we have bread shortage, we have wheat shortage, yeah. we have fuel shortage. We're reliant on countries like uh, Iran predominantly for oil. Um, yeah. Russia is helping as much as it can, but Russia now, of course, is under pressure in Ukraine. Yeah, no, indeed. Indeed, and of course, that was always the intention to 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 to, yeah. to pressurise Russia. I mean, they're very explicit, actually. The Rand Corporation yeah. were commissioned to. I don't know if you're probably familiar with the report. They were commissioned by the the U.S. Uh, uh, Defence uh, uh, yeah. Ministry and um, or Department, whatever they call the uh, the equivalent of the Ministry of Defence in the U.S. To, uh, to to explicitly talk about how you know they could um, extend Russia and uh, weaken yeah. Russia with a view to you know essentially balkanizing it. Well, and also or, Syria has always been targeted for like yes. literally seventy five years since its independence yeah. from France in nineteen forty six no, because no, of yeah. its alliance with yeah. Russia. Yes, you know, first yes, of all, indeed. it was described as, as being anti-communist, and so there were a number of regime changes by the CIA yeah. in 1946, post-1946. Yeah. And yeah. then going yeah. forward, it was uh, anti-Soviet, and then it was at, now, mm. of course, it's anti-Russian. And in fact, the yeah. UK policy towards Syria is a very vindictive one, as Peter Ford, as you know, the, the former... I know, Peter, uh, Peter speaking at a, a rally that we're organising, yeah. no to NATO, no to war, actually, next week, he's speaking. Yeah. Like, yes, I do know Peter, yes, and former, former ambassador, of course. No, yeah, no, exactly. Yeah. And, you know, he describes it as a, as a very vindictive foreign policy yeah. from the UK, yeah. and because it's, yeah. it's rooted in this kind of uh, anti-communist, anti-Soviet, yeah. anti-Russian uh, um, sentiment in the West. Mm. Where does international law stand on all this uh, with, the, with the US, the US, the US stealing uh, uh, the uh, serious oil resources? I mean, does international law allow that? No, of course not. But you know, this is the whole thing, isn't it? We're living in an and age the law. of such yeah. global insecurity. When you look at what Israel is doing in Palestine, what America is doing globally, or the US, I should say, because obviously America is not the US. Mm -hmm. Um, the UK, I mean, global Britain, you know, is pushing again to restore its empire, to to to, yes, to stretch yes, its imperialist tentacles as far as it possibly can. And of course, the Middle East has always been its 
kind of alma mater, hasn't it, really? I mean, yeah, you know, no, they've always course, wanted to course. return. Yes, um, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Vanessa, I mean, uh, people will be moved, I think, by your testimony this evening. Um, you know, we can't, as you said, I mean, send, send money directly to, to Syria. But is there any way that, you know, if anybody watching, mm. people watching, you know, want to help, is there any way in which they can practically offer support and assistance? Or is always yeah. that the question? Yeah, um, there is actually, because funnily enough, when, when we started um, producing fundraisers and some people went on to GoFundMe, which I'm not quite sure why, because, of course, they shut down the, the yeah, yeah, of um, tracker convoy in Canada. Yeah. Indeed. Indeed. Um, and they immediately closed down all of the fundraisers for Syria. But we have managed to get one of them reinstated because we've proven um, it's for humanitarian purposes. We had, to, or, or rather, the people, the organizers had to go through quite a few hoops to do so. But that's up and running again. So I can send you the link for that if you can Great. include it. Um, yes, yes, people, we will, yeah. we've, we've reached 30,000, or I think. Between twenty and thirty thousand on that, so it's okay. it's a considerable amount, yeah. um, and that will be. I know the people that are going to be distributing that inside Syria, and it's like it, it will hundred percent go to the people. So yeah. there's that, um, and that's and there is actually also the Syrian Arab Red Crescent, which is operating inside Damascus and and then sure. radiating out into the um, Syrian government uh, protected areas. Um, so those two would probably be my preferred. Okay. Um, That's great. You know, right. Well, we'll, 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 cer we'll, we'll certainly do what we can then to raise the profile of those. And just finally, mm -hmm. then, um, Vanessa, um, as I said, you're, you're a fearless investigative uh, journalist. <laughs> How can people um, follow your work and uh, keep, keep up with uh, you know your output? Oh, that's really kind of you, Chris. Um, well, I've just recently started up on Substack, which I'm quite enjoying, actually. So I, I would probably recommend that one as the first one. Then, of course, they can follow me on Telegram. Um, on Twitter, I'm still on there. Great. The what's your Twitter <laughs> handle? Uh, what's your Twitter handle, Vanessa? Just Remind Vanessa Beely, at Vanessa Beely. Great, great. Yeah. Well, listen, thank you very much indeed for taking the time out and uh, more power to your elbow. Keep keep doing what you're doing. You're, you're an inspiration, Vanessa. And uh -huh. Thank you so much for taking the time out to speak to us this evening. I'm sure you've moved a lot of hearts uh, tonight uh -huh. and hopefully that will help a little to at least you know, correct the record uh, about what's happening in reality in Syria, but also hopefully uh, enable some additional resources to, to be raised for the, for the victims of this yeah. appalling earthquake. Yes. So thanks again. Sorry, if, go on. If people can just campaign any way they can to lift the sanctions, that's, yes. that's the, you know, and, and for the US to get out of Syria, basically. Yes. Those are the two Absolutely. things that really, you know, Syrians will help Syrians. And yes. they do have, obviously, a lot of uh, allies in, in the kind of non aligned axis or the resistance axis. Um, yeah. but, but that is the main thing that will um, help the Syrian people. Yeah. Well, look, I think a new world order is, is beginning to emerge, yeah. a multipolar, a multipolar yeah. world. Uh, yeah, with fingers crossed. I mean, I think the, uh, the US is over it, and the EU, for that matter, which is just basically its lapdog, as is the United Kingdom, overextended itself with this proxy war in, in Ukraine. I think it's, it's forced closer links between you know, Russia and China and Iran are, in, you know, in that, I mean, and this is, mm. you know, Saudi Arabia is now, which I'm obviously not a fan of Saudi Arabia, but just in terms of its kind of its strategic and important you know, role it plays in relation to uh, energy supplies, is seeming to kind of orientate itself, you know, away from the US orbit a wee bit. So, you know, things could hopefully uh, be moving in a positive direction, a more humanitarian direction. And we, you know, hopefully we can get a more settled world. Because the United States is, is a, you know, is a terrorist state, which is, which is, yeah. well, as is, the, you know, the US establishment that brought untold uh, horrors and uh, and suffering on, on people and continues to do so around the world. And so, yeah. but, you know, the empire, I mean, when empires die, they do thresh out. So let's hope this yeah. is the, you know, the, the, the death of the, of the US empire. Let's, let's hope so. And, uh, I know you're doing your bit to um, you know, speed that along with the information that you're providing. That's really important. So thanks again, well, Vanessa, for this evening. Um, any final thoughts, any final comments before we No, close? just to say thank you to you also for your dedication and integrity because, you know, they, it's a rare breed these days. So I really appreciate that also from you. And thanks for giving me a platform to 
um, put oh, yeah. forward the side, you know, that has really disappeared and erased by corporate media. Well, we, we definitely appreciate you, you coming on. And, and I think there are lots of people with integrity out there. It's just that, we, you know, they're not in positions of power. We need to get to a position. And yeah. this is why, you know, we, we are campaigning, at least in, in, um, in the UK, to... It's hard, obviously, because of the electoral system, the way the media is, you know, so mm. biased against us. Uh, but we're trying to, you know, to build an alternative. And, uh, and that's got to be our salvation, it seems to me. And, you know, we need to draw strength, I think, from liberation struggles around the world. And indeed, you know, the, the tenacity of the, of, the, you know, of the Syrian people, you know, yeah. put up with so much and, uh, and are still standing strong. So, so thanks again. Yeah. And thank you, everybody, for watching this evening. Uh, this is a good night from me, as they say. And we'll see you next week at the same time. Seven o'clock on Resistance TV.